Welcome, my name is Deborah Walker, and I'm speaking to you from Revival from Down Under, which is a Christian church located in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne in Australia. So I'd like to welcome everybody today and those watching online. Delighted to have you with us, with us. Praise the Lord and us with you. Amen. And today I'd like to speak on a topic that I've called, Do Not Defile Your Garments. Do not defile your garments. We're going to need God's help, aren't we? So and with God, all things are possible. Praise God. And so let's just start this topic with reading from the King James Bible, 2 Timothy. It's a good foundational scripture. And, you know, I don't know how many people have really get hold of it, but it's really important that we do get hold of it. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. And it says here that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man, that includes women, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Praise God. So all scripture is both the Old Testament and the New Testament, and it's for our advantage. That's what that word profitable means. It's for our advantage. Let's read it from the Amplified. Every scripture is God breathed, given by his inspiration and it's profitable for instruction, for reproof and conviction of sin, for correction of error and discipline in obedience and for training in righteousness, in holy living, in conformity to God's will in thought, purpose and action so that the man of God may be complete and proficient well fitted and thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so the purpose of all scripture is actually to bring us to full spiritual maturity, full completeness. Praise God. And the Apostle Paul actually tells us how that can be done. Let's turn back to chapter 2 and verse 15. It says here, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We need to rightly divide the word of truth. What God said, he meant what he said, and he wants us all to be literally on the same page. And when we study scripture, we find that God is a God of plan, purpose and pattern. And if we just turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We're just going to read here about what it says of natural Israel. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 11, it says here, Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition, that means warning, upon whom the ends of the world are come. The them, they're written, all these things happened unto them, the, ne the them, is speaking of natural Israel and everything they did is an example it's a pattern it's a figure it's a type or a shadow etc and we are to learn from it we can learn from the good things that they did and take heed take warning from the things that they did which were not pleasing in the Lord's sight let's turn over to Hebrews chapter 10 Hebrews chapter 10 and we read here in verse 1 it says here, for the law, having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices, which they offered year by year, continually make the comers thereunto perfect. The law, of course, they sacrificed animals and those blood sacrificing of the animals never made anybody perfect. But Jesus is the final sacrifice and he is going to make a people perfect perfect and when i say perfect they're going to be complete in character just like him and let's read over it back to hebrews chapter 8 and we're still reading about a bit about the law here verses 1 to 5 it says now of these things which we have spoken the sum is this we have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens and we know that to be jesus Verse 2, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. Now we know that there was a tabernacle called Moses, that Moses built. God told him to make the tabernacle. But what this scripture is saying, there's a natural tabernacle, but the true tabernacle, the true dwelling is that natural 
that natural tabernacle was pointing towards the true tabernacle, which is in heaven. Hallelujah. And verse three, for every high priest, that's every natural high priest, is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore, it is necessity that this man might have somewhat also to offer. For if there were for if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve as an example. So here's the law. They serve as an example and shadow of heavenly things. All right. It's the, um, what we see in the natural is only a shadow of really what's in the heavenly. And so it says, and, and Moses was admonished to God, admonished of God that when he was about to make the tabernacle, for see, says he, that thou make all things according to the pattern shown thee in the mount. So God has a plan and a purpose and he has a pattern and he knows just what he's doing. He's the author and finisher of our faith and he's got the plan. And if we turn over to Hebrews chapter 9 and we read here in verse 9, it says here, and it's talking about the natural, which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. All right. They sacrificed animals, but it didn't make their conscience clear. All right. And verse 23 and 24, it says, for it was therefore necessary that the patterns of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Praise God. Jesus did a complete work on the cross. And before we were saved, we were in sin and were spiritually naked. And then we repented of our sins, gave our lives to Jesus and received salvation through the shedding of his blood. And we were given a spiritual garment of salvation to cover our spiritual nakedness. And this topic is called Do Not Defile Your Garments. Let's turn over to Revelation chapter 3. And we read here in verse 18. And this is what the Lord says. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness does not appear and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. Praise God. And let's just turn back to Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61. And we read here in verse 10, it says here, <clears throat> I will greatly rejoice in the Lord my God. My soul shall, sh shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments and as a bride adorneth herself with jewels. Praise God. Garment of salvation, it's speaking of, and a robe of righteousness. And we read of the robe of righteousness and who will be wearing the robe of righteousness. Let's turn to Revelation 19. Revelation 19 and verse 7 and 8. It says, let us be glad and rejoice and give honour to him for the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife has made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. All right, so at salvation, we get the garment of salvation. But once we're in the bride, we receive a robe of righteousness. And the Lamb's wife, his bride, is fully cleansed and sanctified she'll be a fully cleansed and sanctified church it's a group of people spoken of by the apostle paul let's read it in ephesians chapter 5 this is the group that's going to be in the bride and this is what happens to them praise god and it says in hebrews chapter 5 25 to 27 it says here husbands love your wives even as christ also loved the church and gave himself for it so it's talking about the church that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, 
that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Praise God. She's going to be beautiful. And she's made up of men and women. Praise God. And God's church is going to be without spot, wrinkle or blemish. And it's going to be holy. She's going to be holy. And Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. We read here, 12 verse 14, it says, Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And the Amplified says, verse 14, strive to live in peace with everybody and pursue that consecration and holiness without which no one will ever see the Lord. You know, it's the spots and the blemishes that defile us. And what are the spots and blemishes? Yes, sin can spot our garment. However, in this context of the bride being prepared, God's perfected church, spots and blemishes speak of people. Let's turn to Jude. That's the book just before the book of Revelation, Jude and verse 12. And it's speaking of people here. It says, these are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. And that's also confirmed. Let's turn to Second Peter. Second, just back a bit. Second Peter chapter 2 and verse... 10 to 13 it says and this is we're talking about spots and blemishes but chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government presumptuous are they self-willed they are not afraid to speak evil of dignities whereas angels which are greater in power and might bringing bring no not railing accusation against them before the Lord, but these as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understand not, and they shall utterly perish in their own corruption and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to ride in the daytime. Spots they are and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you people while they feast with you and so where do the spots and blemishes feast where do we feast at the communion table and let's just go back over to Jude again and verse 23 and we read concerning people it says here and others save with fear pulling them out of the fire hating even the garment spotted by the flesh and that word spotted it means defiled or stained or blemished you know, our flesh can spot our garment. Our, our flesh can spot our beautiful garment of salvation. And verse 24, it says, Now unto him, this is the Lord, unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Praise God unto him. And the Lord, he's the one who desires to present us faultless. And how can Jesus present us faultless if we follow his example? Because he was without fault. Let's turn to John chapter 18. John chapter 18 and verse 38. And this is when Jesus went before Pilate. And verse 38, Pilate says to them, what is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and said unto them, I find no fault at all. Speaking of Jesus, Pilate could not find fault with Jesus at all. And then verse 19, verse 4, it says, Pilate therefore went forth again and said unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. And then verse 6, it says, And when the chief priests therefore and officers saw him, they cried out saying, Crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate says unto them, take you him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. And there's another group in the Bible that are spoken of being as faultless. Let's turn to Revelation 14. Revelation 14. 
And this group are faultless. Revelation 14 and verse 5. And we're actually here speaking of the 144,000. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Praise God. And so how can this be done? How can we be faultless? Yes, the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. But we know it's what's in our heart that causes us to sin. And let's turn to Psalm chapter 19. Psalm 19 and verse 12. And we read here. It says, Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. And the Amplified says, verse 12, Who can discern his lapses and errors? Clear me from hidden and unconscious faults. Faults. You know, sometimes we may be doing things. We're not even aware that they're really not okay before the Lord. You know, so, but it's, um, here's the David saying, Lord, cleanse me from my faults, secret faults. And the, this cleansing can only be done and only be achieved through and by God's word. Psalm 119. And we read here in verse 9. It says here, Wherewith shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereunto according to thy word? And the Amplified says, How shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed and keeping watch on himself according to your word, conforming his life to it? Praise God. Again, you know, all things happen to natural Israel and the natural priesthood. And they were an example for us to learn from. And what they did naturally symbolically represents what we do spiritually. And God gave specific commands. Let's turn to Exodus chapter 30. Remember, all scriptures profitable. Exodus chapter 30. And we read here in verse 18 and 19. And it says here, and this is the Lord spoke to Moses and he says, verse 18, Thou shalt also make a laver of brass and his foot also brass to wash withal and, and, that, and thou shalt put it between the tabernacle and the congregation and the altar and thou shalt put water therein. For Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet thereat. All right, so the laver of brass, it's a laver of brass, and that was like a really large bath. All right, they were to wash there. These men were going to wash there. And verse 21, so they shall wash their hands and their feet, right? Wash their hands and their feet, that they die not. And it shall be a statute forever to them, even to him and to his seed through their generations. So it's going to be all the way through the seed and that seed is Christ and we've been grafted into Christ. And so what's that washing for us? You know, to give us uh, just a bit further understanding regarding Moses' tabernacle, we see there were five pieces of furniture in the tabernacle and the bra that was the brazen altar, the brazen laver, the candlestick, the table of showbread and the altar of incense. And these five items of furniture, they symbolically represent God's five ministries in his church in this day hallelujah and they're shown let's turn to ephesians chapter 4 oh i can read it just read it ephesians chapter 4 and it says here 4 verse 11 and it says and he gave some apostles some prophets some evangelists some pastors some pastors and teachers so five ministries praise god and in the tabernacle the table of showbread showbread had 12 loaves of bread on it and the number 12 symbolizes apostolic government as well as the doctrine through the bread symbolizes God's word and so the 12 loaves of bread symbolize the ministry of the apostle all right the apostles doctrine and then the next the other next other item was the candlestick and it had seven lamps and seven is the number for fullness and we know Psalm 119, verse 105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And the lamp symbolized the ministry of the prophet. 
So we're trying to we're trying we're finding these five ministries in the tabernacle. And the altar of incense symbolizes the ministry of the pastor. It says in let's turn to it Psalm 141 Psalm 141 and verse 2 and it says here let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice praise god and so and so that's you know it's speaking of intercession and the pastor is a shepherd and jesus is our good shepherd I'll read it. It's in John 10, verse 11. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd and the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. And so Jesus, we know he's making intercession. Let's turn over to Hebrews chapter 7. Where is he? He's on the right hand of the Father. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25. I really love this scripture. It says, Whereof, wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. That is Jesus' ministry. He is making intercession. Praise God for those that will come to him. Hallelujah. And the brazen altar, which is the fifth one, it was the first piece of the furniture approach, and it was by the door. And this is where the sacrifice of sin was. And Jesus, we know, is the door. And usually the ministry which brings us to Jesus is the evangelist, which is which the brazen altar symbolizes. And brass speaks of judgment of sin. It was made of brass and it speaks of judgment of sin. And isn't that the way it happened? We, when we first were coming to the Lord, you know, we heard a word, usually through an evangelist or somebody sharing the gospel and we were convicted of sin. And so, we, we, you know, we turned to the Lord, praise God. And sorry, and there was one more item, of course, is the brazen laver. That's the fifth one we're coming to. And the brazen laver, that held water to wash in. And this symbolizes the ministry of the teacher. And the water is God's words. And if the priests did not wash, they died. Let's turn back to Exodus chapter 30. Exodus chapter 30. And verse 21. It says here, so they shall wash their hands and their feet that they die not. And it shall be a statute forever to them and to him and to his seed throughout their generations. So our hands, they speak of um, what we do and our spiritual service and our feet. They speak of where we go and our spiritual walk. And again, the priests, they had to wash in the water so they did not die. And we as believers have been called to be priests unto God. I'll read it. It's 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. You also as living stones, lively stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable unto God. In verse 9, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood a holy nation a peculiar people that special people that you should show forth the praises of him who's called you out of darkness into his marvelous light so the believers we are the priests they had priests under the law but now we have priests in in this dispensation and we read what happened on the day of atonement let's turn over to leviticus chapter 16 exodus leviticus chapter 16 and verse 4 and it says, now this is speaking of Aaron, the high priest, he shall put on the holy linen coat and he shall have the linen breeches upon his flesh and he shall be girded with a linen girdle and with a linen mitre shall be he, he be attired. These are the holy garments. Therefore shall he wash his flesh in water and so put them on. The natural priest, the high priest, during the whole rest of the year, he just wore a special outfit. It had special, had 12 stones on the front and 12, six and six on his shoulders, speaking of the tribes and, the, and uh, what's coming. And, and he wore that every for 364 days. But there was one day every year called the Day of Atonement, it happened in the seventh month, that he took all that off and he put only on linen. It was linen, what was it? It was linen coat, a linen breeches. And they a linen girdle and a linen hat. And these were holy garments. Therefore shall he wash his flesh in water. So he had to wash. He had to wash 
before on, he put on these beautiful white garments. And everything happened to natural Israel as an example for us. And let's read on verse 29 to 32. It says, And this shall be a statute forever, that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict your souls and do no work at all, whether it be one of your own country or a stranger that sojourneth among you. For on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you to cleanse you that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. It shall be a Sabbath of rest unto you and you shall afflict your souls by a statute forever. And the priest whom he shall anoint and whom he shall consecrate to minister in the priest's office in his father's stead shall make an atonement and shall put on the linen clothes, even the holy garments. Right? That makes it really clear. It's the day of atonement. It happens in the seventh month, seventh month on the tenth day of that month. And the priest's flesh had to be washed clean before the linen, which is always white, before the white garments could be put on. And so this speaks of our sanctification to righteousness, which is achieved and only achieved by God's word. And Jesus said, oh, we can turn to it, John chapter 17. John 17. So this is Jesus saying it. John 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. That's John 17 verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And the Amplified says, Sanctify them, purify, consecrate, separate them for yourself. Make them holy by the truth. Your word is truth. So how is it going to happen? By the word of God. Praise God. Jesus prayed it and Jesus said it. So that's how it's going to happen. And also we read in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 26. It says, we read it earlier, that he might sanctify and cleanse it, the church, with the washing of water by the word. I mean, God confirms his word throughout the Bible. And so it's our flesh that defiles our garment of salvation. And what are the works of the flesh? We know them. Galatians chapter 5. I'll just read them quickly. Galatians chapter 5, reading from verse 16. But we'll read the introduction here. Verse 16. This I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If we just keep our, our hearts centered in the Lord, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Verse 17, for the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other. So you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. Envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelers, revelings and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I've told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And let me just read verse 19 to 21 in the Amplified. Now the doings, practices of the flesh are clear. They're obvious. They're immorality, impurity, indecency, idolatry sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, ill temper, selfishness, divisions, dissensions, party spirit, fractions or sects with peculiar opinions and heresies, envy, drunkenness, carousing and the like. I want you, I warn you beforehand, just as I did previously, that those who do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. He makes it really clear. Those, if those activities are in our life, we need to repent. Otherwise, we're not going to heaven. It says they will not inherit the kingdom. So we need to repent while we have breath. And if we just turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and just reading here from verse 9, and here is, this is Paul saying this again. This is into the Corinthian church. So there he was speaking to the church of Galatia. Now he's speaking to the church of Corinthians. Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, 
nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you are washed, you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of God. God is washing us. We are, we are washed. We were, we've received um, the washing of the blood, the salvation by the blood. We've been water baptized. Yes. And, you know, we are being sanctified. It's a process. It's a process because even though I'm up to date today, I may sin tomorrow. So it's a process. But what's happening is the word of God working in our heart we are less in, it's making us less inclined to sin because the sin that was in our heart is getting removed by the word of God and the word of God is filling up our heart. Praise God. Let me just read that from the Amplified verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous and the wrongdoers will not inherit or have any share in the kingdom of God? Do we realize that? Do not be deceived, misled, neither the impure and immoral nor idolaters, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor those who participate in homosexuality, nor cheats, swindlers and thieves, nor greedy graspers, nor drunkards, nor foul mouth revilers and slanderers, nor extortioners and robbers will inherit or have any share in the kingdom of God. And such of you were once, and such some of you were once, but you were washed clean, purified by complete atonement for sin and made free from guilt of sin. And you were consecrated, set apart, hallowed, and you were justified, pronounced righteous by trusting in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit of our God. Hallelujah. So when we turn to the Lord, we, we are made righteous. But then the next day, as I said, you know, because sin hasn't been dealt with in our heart, it's been forgiven but there is still there. And so God is doing a process in our hearts. Um, let's turn to Matthew chapter 15 and see what Jesus says. And this just confirms this. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 15, verse 16. And it says here, Matthew chapter 15 and verse 16. Starting there, and Jesus said, Are you also without understanding? Do you not understand that whatsoever go enters in at the mouth goes into the belly and is cast out into the draft? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands for defiles not a man. Jesus said these things, and even what we read in Corinthians, they're in our heart. And that is what God is working out. And verse uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 28, it says here, But I say unto you that whosoever looketh at a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. All roads lead to the heart. And that is why God desires to write his word on our hearts. And it's his word that cleanses and purifies and sanctifies our hearts. Praise God for the word. We so need to value God's word. And let's turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 3. And it says here, For as much as you were a manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in the fleshly tables of the heart. Now, in the time of Moses, remember, uh, God wrote the commandments with his finger on the tables of stone. But now we are the living stones and God is writing his word on our hearts. Praise God. And we just need more and more of the word. And it's washing us. Every time we hear the word, it is washing us. Right. Like we wash every day in that in the natural. We wash every day. Well, every time we're in the word, hearing the word, reading the word, studying the word, it is washing our heart. And we need to be washing our heart every day. And even, you know, they were commanded to gather the manna every day. Why? Because now we know not only it's feeding our spiritual man, but it's also washing our heart. And let's turn to John chapter 15, John 15 and see what else Jesus said. John 15. And verse 3, 
And this is what Jesus said. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. What's the word that Jesus has spoken? All scripture. Because Jesus is God the word. Hallelujah. So all word is what God has spoken. And of course, all these prophets wrote it all down. Praise God. And if I just go back to 2 Timothy chapter 3. So all scripture. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Um, we just read here. And verse 16 again. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And why is it given? Because it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Uh, and the Amplified says every scripture is God breathed, given by his inspiration. And it's profitable for instruction, for reproof, for conviction of sin, for correction of error and discipline in obedience and for training in righteousness, in holy living, in conformity to God's will, in thought, purpose and action. Praise God. God's word is alive and powerful. Let's turn over to Hebrews chapter 4. And verse 12, it says, the word of God is quick. That means it's alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and the marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's how powerful God's word is. It goes right deep down into our very innermost being. The Amplified says, for the word that God speaks is alive and full of power, making it active, operative, energizing and effective. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating to the dividing line of breath of life, which is the soul and the immortal spirit of the joints of the marrow and of the deepest parts of our nature, exposing and sifting and analyzing and judging the very thoughts and purposes of the heart. You know, when we're around the word of God, if there's things in our heart that aren't, uh, that are, uh, need to be dealt with the word of God should be pricking our heart saying and, and he puts his finger on things you know prick 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 and uh, oh Lord I didn't know that was there or I, I didn't know it was there Lord please take it out of my heart just take it away help me you know I repent take it away help me not do it again and you know God is going to have a holy church a holy city just like we read before in Revelation and according to this next scripture, the holy city is the lamb's wife, his bride. Let's go to Revelation 21. Revelation 21 and verse 2. And it says here, And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. What a moment. John saw this. God's, however God did it, he saw it. I mean... What a privilege. We read about it, but John saw it. But, you know, in our heart, we need to see it too. That's the vision. That's what God's got planned. And verse 9 and 10, it says, And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. God's not looking to natural Jerusalem. God's looking to what he's doing and he's calling it heavenly Jerusalem. It's a spiritual Jerusalem. Praise God. This is what God is doing in the earth. And it's all about hearts that will draw near to God and allow God, Lord, have your way. Offer ourselves a living sacrifice. Lord, do what you need to do. Change me into your very likeness. Praise God. And you know, that heavenly Jerusalem is in heavenly places. And we as believers are to be seated in heavenly places. And Revelation 21 verse 27 says, And there shall no, in no wise enter into it, this is the city of God, anything that defileth neither whatsoever worketh abomination or makes a lie. So no liars are going to heaven, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. So if there's any shortcomings in us still, we need to repent, right? And if we, if life lying and whatever is, is part of who we are, we need to repent and make sure we do things right and just speak the truth. People only lie out of fear. Well, we've got to be people of faith. Um, if we do things honestly 
do things that's right. There's nothing to fear. We're just doing it in God. So, but we don't want to be defiled and we don't want to be uh, making any abominations or making any lies. We want to be part of that city. Amen. Because those that are defiled, those all those activities and all that we read in Corinthians and Galatians, they defile you. And no defiled is going to be in that city. No defiled is going to be in the bride. And as mentioned earlier, we are the priests of God and he wants to wash us and give us a change of garment. Let's turn to Zechariah. Zechariah, just about the last, second last book in the Old Testament. Zechariah. And we read here in chapter 3. And it's actually speaking of uh, Joshua, the high priest back then. And it's chapter 3. And we're just going to read it. And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that has chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Now Joshua's clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. And he answered and spake and said unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thy iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. You know, our righteousness is as filthy rags. And we, we, we come to God, we are full of sin, and God just takes away. When we turn to him, he takes it away. He washes us clean, makes us brand new, born again, and it's a new beginning. And verse 5, And I said, Let them set a fair mitre upon his head. So they set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord stood by, and the angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, if thou wilt walk in my ways, and if thou wilt keep my charge, then thou shalt also judge my house, and thou shalt also keep my courts, and I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by thee. Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant the branch, praise God, for behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua upon one stone shall be seven eyes, Behold, I will engrave the engraving thereof, says the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity. Listen to it. I will remove the iniquity of the land in one day. And in that day shall the Lord of hosts, shall you call every man his neighbor under the vine and under the fig tree. He, what did he say in verse 9? I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. Speaking of the day of atonement. It's the marriage of the lamb. There's coming a day when there'll be no more sin in our hearts. Praise God. Bring it on, Lord. We're just so looking forward to that day. And he's looking forward to that day. Every bridegroom is looking forward to seeing his bride. And every bride is looking forward to see her bridegroom. Praise God. And of course, that one day is the day of atonement. And let's turn to Ecclesiastes. So just after Psalms, Proverbs... Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, chapter 9, and we read here verse 8. This is just beautiful. Let thy garments be always white, and let thy head lack no ointment. And the Amplified says, let your garments be always white with purity. And let your head not lack the oil of gladness. Praise God. And finally, we just turn back to Revelation chapter 3. And we read here in verse 4 and 5. And we know the seven churches in the book of Revelation speak of the fullness of the end time church. And in chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, it says, Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Hallelujah. And it says here in verse 5, He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before the angels. Hallelujah. And everybody said, 
Amen.